Well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Dr. Frank Connor. I am the chair of the psychology department here at Grand Rapids Community College. And it is uh, my pleasure to talk to you about how we write in the social sciences and really broadly in the sciences as a whole. So not only the social sciences, the, 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 the writing that I'm going to be talking about would manifest itself in uh, medicine, the legal arena, um, and, and certainly any of the broader sciences, anything from biology to psychology to history to economics. So I'm going to begin by showing you four examples of real writing, and then we're going to take a moment and talk about it. What are you noticing, the characteristics, the attributes of these pieces? So there's going to be two published research articles, and then a, um, um, a clinical um, assessment from a social worker, and then a clinical diagnosis by a psychologist. So here's the first one. Um, this is actually an article written by me uh, that was published looking at the difference between um, uh, successful students in an online environment versus students who weren't successful in an online environment. And this is part of the analysis piece. This is part of the summary afterwards. So just take a moment, read it on your own, and make sense out of the kind of writing. Not the content. You're not going to be quizzed on what it says. Uh, but what, what is this, what, what do you notice about the type of writing? So now we're going to look at the next one. Uh, the next one is by Dr. Dylan Carr, who is a professor in anthropology here at the college. And this is a published article that he was doing um, around um, migration and, and uh, fossil identification. So just take a quick read it on your own. Not as easy to read. I mean, it's well written, but unless you're an anthropologist, it's not as easy to read. So those were two published scholarly ar uh, articles, the kinds of things that researchers write. And obviously, these are just a small excerpt. Now, the next one is a, um, a clinical assessment of somebody who came in with a social worker. Obviously, the name have been changed of the person. Um, I'm also this uh, uh, a colleague of mine. I'm not even going to identify who the social worker is. We want to make sure we complete full anonymity to this, this person. So Looking at the fourth one now, and again, this is a psychological assessment. This, so this is somebody who was already, um, so this is an initial assessment when somebody comes in the first time they met with the social worker, and then this is a, this basically what would be considered the field notes or a, the, the clinical notes. This is actually uh, an excerpt of a report um, on a person who has been assessed. Again, you're not going to be tested on the content. That would not be fair. Just talk about the writing. OK, so this is a real question to you. What do you notice about this writing? What do you notice on all four of these? What is common? The scholarly article on psychology, but looking at education, an anthropology article, 
a social work initial assessment and then a, uh, a more in-depth assessment uh, in, a, in a clinical situation. So what do you notice about these writings? A lot of definitions, right. To keep clear. Yep, so there's a lot of definitions. And so if there's a lot of definitions, there's probably also a lot of what? Terms. Yeah, technical terms, specific terms. So we have technical terms, specific terms to the discipline, whatever it happens to be, a definition of those, and then you really have hidden two of the three primary things we're interested in. What would be... One more. What is this writing trying to do? Right, and information about what? They're all a little different, but... Yeah, some phenomenon, some, so whether it's a person, whether it's migration, whether it's self, you know, they're, they're, they're applying some body of knowledge to a specific phenomenon. And in doing that, they need to write in such a way that even a novice reader, and I'm not sure the anthropology, a novice person could read it all that well, but e even um, a novice person can make some sense out of it. So that really is, in a nutshell, the process of scientific writing or evidence-based writing. So to write in a scientific way, you have to know something. So how you know things, I brought this along just as an example. So in this, um, the social worker example, uh, uh, the social worker rep rep references the DSM-5. This is the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is the di uh, a Diagnostics and Statistical Manual for Psychiatry. It's essentially the encyclopedia that lists all of the psychological disorders, all of the characteristics, and possible treatment. So in referencing the DSM, this in my world is an absolute factual document. If it's not in here, we can't diagnose it. We can't get insurance. We can't, I mean, this is a factual document in my world. How much is that? Uh, I don't know, they're not cheap, 100 bucks or so. Um, so before you can do any kind of evidence-based writing, before you can do any kind of science-based writing, you must be informed about the subject matter. You have to know something about what you want to write about. How do you do that? Well, one of the primary ways that you might do it is you review the literature. So in reviewing the literature, so we're actually going to do this in a moment, see how it works. But in reviewing the literature, you have to have some topic area. What do you want to look at? You have to have some phenomenon. Now, here's the interesting part is while these are in order, notice they're not numbered, because frankly, writing, as you know, is an iterative process. It goes back and forth. So you don't just start at one, I I at one level and just move through. So you have to know what you're going to study. What are you going to be writing about? Are you going to be writing, you're going to apply this to a person, to a movie, you're going to apply it to a psychological disorder, you're, are you going to apply it to the migration of geese across North America? You're, you have to have some phenomenon, you have to have, know something that you're going to apply it to. With that basic concept, you then need to make yourself informed. Because as you saw in the writing, you're going to be using technical terms that you need to define and then you need to provide evidence from the phenomenon to support your position. So you can't do this kind of writing without starting with at least a base knowledge around the subject area. So the ways that you do that, you do a review of the literature, you do a lit review, whether it's a formal one or an informal one. So you delve deep into the research. What do people say about the migration of geese in North America? 
What's the research say about ADHD in children under 13? What does the research say about the way the Industrial Revolution shaped the location of African Americans in the United States? That's where you begin. You begin by becoming informed. You begin by searching the literature. As you do that, I highly recommend that you not only read the literature, but start creating your own guide, your own notes. Start defining your own terms. One of the things I recommend to my students is that you create a sheet that has the concept and your own definition, and then a reference. The concept, the term, the theory, your own definition, and a reference that as you're informing yourself, also make notes, it makes it a whole lot easier to apply the concepts, it makes it a whole lot easier to write your paper. I'm a relative expert in psychology. However, in this article here, one of the things that emerged was around issues of self-efficacy and self-efficacy in the classroom. I understand self-efficacy as a concept, but I was not an expert on how do you build self-efficacy self in a classroom. So I had to go back to the literature. So as I said, this whole process here is highly iterative. You're going to constantly move back and forth. You create a foundational knowledge, and then you get into the phenomenon, and you find out, oh, I don't really know anything about that. Then you have to go back to the literature. Annotated, annotated bibliographies are a great way to do it. In fact, it's a great resource, particularly for those of you who are going into anything close to the sciences. Starting now, every paper you write, you should create an annotated bibliography. You should have the, 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 the original source and then write a quick paragraph summarizing what this article is about. When you go on to transfer to a four-year school, those of you who go to graduate school, that will become such a great resource for you. Once you've read, read an article, document it. It becomes part of your information source. So then, you identify spe uh, a specific phenomena. Again, this is iterative, it goes back and forth. Then the process is you apply the subject matter, this, to this. That's the writing part. You describe, predict, or explain the phenomenon. Why did this happen? What does the research tell us about it? What might we expect to happen next? Assume that your readers are ignorant. Assume that your readers don't know what you're talking about. You're the expert now trying to communicate some explanation of some phenomenon. Err on providing too many definitions. Err on anything that seems technical. Certainly anything that showed up in your lit review, anything that showed up in your uh, uh, interviewing an expert, anything that showed up, assume that your reader doesn't know what that is and provide a brief explanation. Then, of course, you have to support your analysis. You have to give examples from the phenomenon to say, yes, this is true. Yes, people migrated this way, and here's an example. Feel free to ask questions anytime you want. I know I'm just sort of storming through this, but. So, it's one thing to see it, but we're going to do it. So what we're going to do here is, um, well, I'm going to do it. You're going to follow along. We don't have enough time for you to do it. Um, we're going to apply theories of social psychology to a scene from the movie To Kill a uh, Mockingbird. Now, we don't have time to do a lit review. We don't have time to you to go off to the library. Um, so I'm going to let you know up front that the probable subject matter content will focus on group behavior and aggression. So the scene that we're going to look at will focus on group behavior and aggression. Now, 
We don't jump straight into the movie. What do we do before we get to the clip? It's on the last slide. What's the first thing we do when we're going to do this kind of evidence-based writing? What's that? Check the book. Elaborate. We could, but in this case, we're going to look at this scene as a pure phenomenon. So what's the first thing? Well, we can't provide examples yet because we haven't watched it. So before we watch it, what? Yeah, exactly. The first thing we need to do is to become somewhat competent, have some understanding of group behavior and aggression. So we need to do some research on our own. Now, if this is a, if for a class, maybe you've got a textbook that you can use. If it's an applied paper, then maybe that's acceptable. But if you're doing this as part of a broader, sort of a true research project, then you would do a lit review. You'd go out and look at what does the literature say about group behavior and aggression. And there's a whole body of research around that. Now, because we have minimal time, I've already done that for you, at least in a very, very small way. So some basic concepts and terms in um, group behavior and aggression, the individuation, a loss of indiv indiv individuality leading to a loss of individual accountability. You can read these. So the individuation, personal self, conformity, and then some factors that contribute to aggression the environment, and a weapons effect. Now, this is a small little summary of the research. Obviously, you might have a much longer one because we don't know that these are going to show up. Well, I know they will, or I, they would not be very good for you. If it, so the first thing you've got to do is to become knowledgeable about the subject. Now, once again, it's an iterative process. You may get into it, and some things showed up, that you didn't know about, and then you can go reach, research them. But you can't just jump in to the analysis without having some content background. Otherwise, you're just going to be lost. So let's see if this is going to work. My recommendation would be that after doing this lit review, after getting a sense of your content, you have that beside you as you're watching the movie. Reality is even, even in professional practice. If you became a social worker, um, I, you don't memorize this thing. So what happens is, as you're meeting with a client, you're taking notes, having a sense of the broad categories in here. And what you're trying to do is to take this content and then apply it to the phenomenon. So in writing a paper, what my recommendation is, after doing this, and then as you're watching the movie, you are writing examples beside each one of these of where it shows up in that phenomenon which probably means you're going to have to watch either the entire movie or you're going to have to, whatever you're applying it to, you're probably going to have to review it more than once. If you're doing a case study on somebody with a psychological disorder, if you are uh, looking at research, again, on the migration of, uh, of, of geese in North America, if, whatever it is that you're studying, once you do your lit review, once you get your content, you start going back and forth. And as I said, writing is always an iterative process. You're always going back and forth. You're always rewriting. You're always looking at, is this a good example? Is this 
am I applying this phenomenon or the, the, this content correctly? So I know that um, we did this very quickly. So I'm not even going to ask you to try and go back and come up with examples. But I did that for you. So I know this is a lot to read. And I apologize, but I needed the content in here. So I've got two paragraphs for you here. So this is evidence-based writing. This is how we write in the scientist, taking these two things, this and this, oops, oops well, this and the movie, and combining them into written form. So just go ahead and read that first one, read the first paragraph. It's obvious, but because I like to ask questions. So what do you notice about this writing? Do you see how these two things came together? Let's take a look at the second paragraph. You'll notice that there are citations in here. Again, depending on the class, depending on what your professor, if you're writing this for a class, how you use or don't use citations is going to be part of an assignment. You'll notice back in this writing here, if we go all the way back to uh, both of these assessments, there are, there are no citations. Talk about the DSM. Talk about particular assessment tools but they're not referenced. In a professional environment, if we are using standard instruments, then we don't make a reference to them. Anybody in the field knows what a DSM-5 is. Now, if you are meeting with the client, or if you are meeting with the parents, or if you're meeting with the caregivers, then as part of a verbal explanation, or if you're doing a more detailed report, you might explain what these particular references are. Citations do two things for us. What's the obvious thing that citations do for us? Why are you being asked to put citations into a paper? So you're not accused of plagiarizing and nobody wants that. But there's another, actually, is a scholarly document even a more important reason? I don't know if there's anything more important than not cheating, but it backs it up but it also connects it to an ongoing narrative. The reality is research is not stagnant. When you write any kind of research paper, when you do any kind of research, when you're doing scientific research and when you're doing a scientific presentation, you are entering into an ongoing narrative. You are inserting yourself into a dialogue that is happening in the scientific community. And the reference are ways in which you connect back to that community. So it shows that your paper, your research, your analysis is connected to something else. That's also useful because what if, which you might be interested in, what if you actually want to know something about the weapons effect? It's a well-researched area in social psychology. But this is simply a, a, a quick little reference here. It doesn't explain it in depth. What if you want to know, wow, I didn't even realize that was a thing. I want to learn more about it. Well, that's the other piece, 
is that a citation allows you, the reader, to now go deeper, which is what allows me as the writer to not have to explain everything. I don't have to give every minute detail of this research or this ongoing dialogue that I'm connecting to. I have to give a summary. I have to make it clear what I'm talking about. If you want to know more, go to and Anderson, Benjamin, and, and Barthwell. They have a whole bunch of research on it, as do other folks. So citations are more than just keeping you from being accused of plagiarism. They communicate that my research is situated in a whole body of research, that it's an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing narrative. And it allows the, the reader to, um, to find out more if they need to. I'm going to give you some suggestions for doing this work on your own, but what are your questions so far? How many of you find this kind of writing, and I know for my students, this is not comfortable writing for many people? And that's, and that's why I say air, well, if you're dealing with professional notes, and that's really what these are, these are professional notes. And here you probably wouldn't, although if you think it's something that the reader might, so in this case, this is something that would not, th this is, this, these are clinical notes that are just going to be in the file. So, you know, if, if, if this is a social worker, or the clinical psychologist who's working on the team wants to read this, they know what all of this means. So you have to think about who's going to be reading it. No, no. These would be. These two both would be, actually these both were submitted to peer review and are both published articles. And they have the references right. So you have to think, as with all writing, you have to think about your audience. Who's going to read it? What else do you observe? What are other thoughts? What do you struggle with in doing this kind of writing? Some of you have maybe not done this kind of writing yet. I guarantee not everybody in this room is getting an A on their evidence-based papers right now. So, yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things that you have to get away from is that, and we'll look at that in, in, the, in the, um, uh, the do's and don'ts here in a moment, is that for, for many people, they find evidence-based writing or scientific writing boring. It is. The beauty is in the content, not the writing. Which is a, that, that's a, that's a contradiction or a conflict something. I mean, some of you are, I suspect, really good creative writers and you really can use metaphor and you can paint a story I just mixed my metaphors there, but um, you, 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 you are wonderful at, 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 at sharing and making and, and creating descriptions, and, and we don't want any of that. It's not that that's wrong. I love poetry. I think there is tremendous value in poetry in, 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 in both as a society and, and as individuals getting to know themselves. There's archetypal meaning in poetry that can't be discovered any other way. But poetry is not scientific writing. So yes, it's boring, it's factual, but the beauty is in what it's communicating, not the writing itself. In fact, one of the things you have to do is don't let the writing get in the way of the content. So let's look at some of the do's and don'ts. This is actually a, a summarized, I pulled out some of the key ones uh, one of the best guides for writing in, in really all of the, at least the social sciences, um, is writing for psychology by the Department of Psychology at Harvard. It's a wonderful manual. Um, it's a great resource. It's available online. But some of the don'ts and do's that they provide in doing this work. Don't write a novel, but do tell a story. Now that's a struggle sometimes. In fact, I'm on a dissertation committee right now for a person, uh, he, he's uh, seeking his PhD. 
He's struggling right now with the lit review because he knows a lot of content, but he, he can't form it into a story. So he's got a whole bunch of research and it's just sort of thrown into this chapter, but it doesn't flow. The reader can't, can't see where he's heading with it. What's his point? Where are you going with this? So even though it's factual, it should still tell a story. Don't editorize. Express your point of view through objective presentation of the evidence. Don't, what, what I mean by that is don't say things like, well, it would be foolish to assume. Or it's common knowledge. You're now subtly inserting your opinion. The, the, the stark reality, and I think everybody who's gone to graduate school has heard something like this, particularly if it's in the sciences. I don't give a damn about your opinion. I have literally heard more than one professor say that to somebody. They don't mean it in a pejorative way. I know it sounds like, whoa. What, what they're trying to emphasize is the point is that you let the facts, you let the science present an argument, not you. Be really careful with, over, uh, with, with secondary sources. Um, in fact, I typically don't allow students to use secondary sources. The reality is a secondary source, so like the New York Times, the New York Times presents research on um, aggression in children, and they're presenting a research article. Read the original article. They're going to have a reference there. Go and read the original article. You don't, don't trust the New York Times. Don't trust anybody who's writing a story about a story. They're trying to sell newspapers, not communicate science. If you cite an author, you must have read the article. To not do so is cheating. It's plagiarism. It's unethical. Don't overuse technical jargon, but sometimes we have to, and then define your terms. Again, you've got to let the reader know what you're talking about. Don't overuse direct quotations. You have to rephrase and summarize the important points of writing. In uh, research methods, one of the classes I teach, we just spent some time on what's the difference between plagiarizing and not. And in reality, it comes down to you take an author's idea, you resummarize it in your words, and you still give them credit for their ideas. Don't write in first person. Always write in third person. Don't make your thesis a guessing game. Say right out of the gate, here's what this paper is about. Here's what I'm going to do. And then do it, and then summarize. Here's what I just talked about, and here's what it is. Again, yeah, it's boring. People should not struggle with an evidence-based or a scientific paper on what you're trying to communicate. Be straightforward, explicit. Don't use vague pronouns. You'll notice in here, there is no he or she. It starts to get confusing. Who are we talking about? Don't use passive voice. Use active voice whenever possible. Don't include more than one idea per paragraph. And I'll be honest, I should probably write in here, um, use paragraphs. <laughs> it's a very frustrating thing when you're trying to read a student paper and they have like four paragraphs and they're really well written and you've got this, but don't use colloquialisms. Uh,
don't say things like, he's on the mend. Just present the data. Don't treat opposing views unfairly. It's not a position paper. Present the research, present the data, and let the research, let the data, let the subject content area support your position. Lastly, as I've said over and over and over, writing is an, yes. It's again, it's just a write, you get used to it. You get used to the writing style. I mean, it's not that you can't use them, but the only time you'd want to use them is if you're working in a paragraph and everybody reading it knows you're talking about her. So you're, you know, so it's very clear. So there's no going back and forth. So in this case, you know, we had several characters in here. So going back and forth, well, now who are we talking about? But right, if it's, an, if, if it's one idea, one concept, one person, then yeah, you're fine. As I said, writing is an iterative process. Do not assume that one draft is going to cut it. Don't assume that one analysis is enough. Because even though you've done your lit review and you've done it very well, until you start applying it, you don't know what's going to emerge. That initial, uh, uh, the, the, the initial lit review simply creates a foundation for you to get into the content, to do, get you into the subject matter. You may then, once you get in it, see things that, so I wonder why African Americans migrated to Detroit, but not Pittsburgh. Why did Pittsburgh get more white Appalachian people, and Detroit got more African American people from the South during the Industrial Age? So, as you're reading or as you're studying the phenomenon, questions will start coming up. And then you go back to the literature to see if you can come up with an answer for that. That's it. So other questions, thoughts, references, concerns? Remember this. This is the essence of what you need to do. This boils it down. If you can do this, everything else will come back to you. Remember that you must be informed. You have to have a specific phenomenon. Apply the subject matter. Define your terms and use examples. This is the essence of what we're talking about. Once you can do this, you can fill in the rest. Yes? Right. Absolutely. You'll want to, well, you mean that, that, that the research has been shown to be wrong? Yes, and it's not important to your point, but it's the approach Well, the, now it gets, now we're moving a little bit, even though these are not position or persuasion papers, sometimes you have to bring persuasion theory into it. If you can assume that the readers are going to be knowledgeable of that counterpoint, then you should introduce it and also present the information why this counterpoint is not valid. Right. So if you wanted to do, you know, the anti-vaccine movement, the, the research is clear that, the, that, that, that the, the science does not support that position. So if you're doing an article about vaccinations and how you should vaccinate, yes, you should probably reference because it's a, people know about it. So you would make a little section now. Yes, there's a counter movement and here's what they believe and here's why they believe, but here's what the research shows.
The thing is, if there's something that everybody knows and you don't call it out, they're going to be, they're going to question, okay, do you really understand this area? Do you really understand this subject? Because there's a whole body of research, or at least there's a, 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 a cultural thread that runs in opposition to this. So you really need to talk about it. In the same way, if I was doing a, a, a paper on, on uh, the psychology of love, and we know the research on the psychology of love is very clear when you like it, opposites attract or do birds of a feather flock together. The research is overwhelming, birds of a feather flock together. The more alike you are, the more likely you're gonna stay married uh, or stay in a relationship for the long term. However, I would probably have to at least include a little piece in that article about so yes, there is a cultural myth that believes this, and this is why. So again, if you think the reader is knowledgeable, and you should introduce it. Okay, thank you.